What happened after December 10th, 1997? How did I suddenly worm the NWA invasion onto the television screens of the WWF? I remember that I was home in my house in, in uh, I actually lived in Huntington, Connecticut. It was a s suburban area up there. I was at my house in Connecticut and the phone rings and I know it was a Sunday because the reason why I was not on the road headed toward uh, a raw taping on Monday was because the raw that Monday was in Long Island at Nassau Coliseum is our drive away. I also know by looking up the books that the only WWF event on that Sunday was in Hamilton, Ontario. It was an afternoon show. It was a house show, and Vince wasn't going to be there. None of the writing team would have been there. I wasn't there. I was announcing at that point also, but I didn't need to be there. Blah, blah, blah. So I get a call on Sunday, and this sounds like one of those things that Vince McMahon finally pulls the trigger on and he's been mulling over or that somebody has pitched him. and. He does it at the last minute. And basically the call was, Jim, you know all the guys in the NWA. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't mean, let me try this again. Not all the guys in the NWA, but the NWA board of directors. Howard Brody was the president at the time. Dennis Corluzzo was the, the guy who was really the mover and shaker behind most of the shows that were being run at the point, and the NWA tournaments and everything. But um, he asked if, Jeff Jarrett, who was returning or had just returned or was about to return, could be in some way affiliated with the NWA and the NWA give their blessing with this. And this came out of completely nowhere. Well, I, on Vince's part, Howard Brody had been beating up the office with faxes and phone calls for about a year trying to do something, but nobody would get back to him. But all of a sudden, but it made sense because everybody knew that Vince Russo, for whatever reason, at that time was friends with, that's no longer the case, Jeff saw through him after a while, but it was friends with and liked Jeff Jarrett. And why he liked the epitome of a Southern wrestler, and I mean that in a good way, in a positive way, I have no idea, but everybody knows that he and Jeff were close, and Russo's one that for several years, the only time Jeff got used was if Vince was in charge. Anyway, I say, yes, I know these guys, and I'm. It, it, can they come to television? Can can Jeff be the NWA world champion? I, was, I said, no, they've already got a goddamn NWA world champion, and they can't switch it in the next 36 hours, but I'm sure they'd like to to work with you, and I knew, and I'm trying to think, you might know, was it Dennis or was it Howard that got that brand new, uh, nice looking NWA? What was it? The North American title? North American, yeah. Uh, the belt. They had a nice new belt. One of them had got that belt. And I said, they got a North American title and it's a pretty belt. And I bet you, you know, he could be that. We'll find out. So that's the direction I got on this. It, this is Sunday. I'm at home in Connecticut. And our TV taping the following day, as I said, was in uh, Nassau Coliseum in Long Island. And then the following day was Raw for the next week, December 30th. We were taping in New Haven, Connecticut, taping Raw for January 5th. And that's where they wanted it. So I call Howard Brody because he's the one's going to have to make this decision. And I went to Howard's biography. And because I knew that was this short, that was a very short, uh, short notice thing. And Howard wrote a biography. His original manuscript was a thousand pages. He wrote down every fast food order he'd ever made. Um, and there's there's a, a, a couple of factual errors here in this couple yeah. of paragraphs, which I will point out. Well, they're just the ones I'm going to read, but, but it's the way that Howard saw it in his mind. Because this is the way he started out. About a month later, during because he'd talk about continuing to reach out to the WWF for, to no avail. But about a month later, during a Sunday night booking committee meeting, is because I called him on a Sunday night, and I said, Howard, I've just heard about this. So he thought we were in a meeting. I'm sitting at fucking home, suddenly got into, like when they called me and said, hey, can you get a bump and hoe for Tuesday in Phoenix, right? Uh, but after a Sunday night booking committee meeting, we'd never had one of those. 
Vince, unless it was a production meeting at, at pay-per-view. McMahon, Cornette, Vince Russo, and the rest of the writing staff. I also didn't call Howard and preface him. Hey, Howard, I'm not on the writing team anymore, but we got an idea. Um, they were trying to come up with a storyline for Jeff Jarrett, who was returning to the WWF. Someone suggested he hold some type of championship and tout himself as being representative of some imaginary organization. Um, I actually didn't remember that part of it. I thought we got specifically to the fucking NWA because it's why I was calling him. But anyway, he says, while McMahon liked the concept, he didn't like the idea of a fictional group. So Howard probably nosing around. This may be some of the backstory. He then turned to Cornette or he phoned Cornette and asked, what about the NWA? Cornette knew all too well we'd jump at the chance to get the NWA brand on WWF television, especially after trying for nearly a year. So basically, you know, that's how it happened. That Sunday night, Cornette called me in Tampa to ask if Dennis and I could be in New Haven on Tuesday, explaining that they wanted to give the NWA North American title to Jarrett. I later learned they initially wanted Jarrett to have the world title, but Cornette knew we wouldn't go for that. But without hesitation, I said yes, and Cornette said he'd call Dennis to fill him in. A half hour later, Dennis called me. Uh, so that was fucking Sunday night to, to do this on a raw taping on Tuesday. That's how they started fucking thinking. No uh, advance planning whatsoever. But again, that's the first I heard of it when it was a fucking deal where, okay, ask these guys if we can do this. So in New Haven on December 30th, I have Howard Brody there. I have Dennis Corluzzo there. We got the title belt there. Jeff is back. And the big debut of this is I basically go to the ring with Dennis and Howard and announce that these are the representatives from the NWA and the next match will determine the new NWA North American champion. And then Jeff Jarrett wrestles Barry Windham. And... After I whack Barry with the tennis racket, Jeff pins him in three minutes and 35 seconds. So this NWA invasion starts with me bringing out two guys that, and in all due respect to Howard and Dennis, two guys that nobody on national television had ever seen before or had connected in any way with the NWA that hadn't been a major force on television in eight years. And I announced that the next match will determine the North American title. And then Barry Windham, who 10 years to the day previously had probably been the best worker in the business, who was had injuries at that point, had gained weight, had not been presented in a major spot in either promotion in several years, and honestly saw, because he was smart to the business, saw the spot he was being put in and was less than motivated. And Jeff Jarrett coming back trying to make the best of it in three minutes. And then, Brian, do you remember what happened after that match was over with? No, actually. As soon as that match was over with, they ran Steve Aust uh, Steve Austin, Steve Austin out, and st or Steve Austin out. Neither one. They ran Steve Austin out, and he fucking hit a stunner on Jarrett, who just won this prestigious title, <laughs> and then and then got up, and mocked his fucking strut. So that was so that obviously was my idea. That's the way that I would debut newcomers and a new promotion and an invasion this wasn't an invasion the nwa invasion was like the invasion of the united states by the isle of malta right what so then wait a minute let me stop you because you've been going on for a little bit i know i have just to clarify vince russo is now saying that this was all your idea this is the quote that i was sent that was reproduced on a on a news site I, as I said, I'm not going to give any of his broadcasts or any of his interviews any, but the the reasoning behind this whole thing that I'm going through it about to go through for you, more of this, is that Vince McMahon was supposedly fed up with me sitting there telling all these stories about the old days and the real wrestling and the NWA and the Midnight Express. And he decided to just say, fuck it, we're just going to go ahead and book this and show Cornette that this shit won't draw these days. Because, of course, that's the way Vince McMahon thinks. He Say what you will about him, and we have, especially lately, a lot. But I don't think anybody's ever said that he, as a personal rib, was going to give over a bunch of his television time to shit that he didn't even think was going to work and wasn't entertained by personally just to prove a point. 
And also, see, here's another thing. You know, these fucking pathological liars, they justify in their heads what they're saying to themselves so often in order in going over their stories to get it straight and or they're sympathetic to themselves anyway. So that's ends up being the way they remember it. But I've mentioned before stories about being on the creative team when it was myself and Bruce Pritchard and Vince and Jr. was there for a lot of it. And that was the four of us that would ride in the car to the TV tapings for the majority of 1996 pay-per-views and TVs when we were officially traveling we would tell a lot of stories. If you're in the car, or more importantly, Bruce and JR and I would tell a lot of stories when we were waiting for Vince McMahon, which happened a lot. And that carried over. But then when it became me and Bruce and Shitstain, you were always waiting for Vince on the phone in his study with one of his problem children or whatever the fuck. He was on Vince time. So you sat there and you bullshit and you told stories because you can't do anything con constructive until the fucking conductor gets back. Now, in hindsight, I can see me and Bruce Pritchard telling old wrestling stories, me telling one of mine or him telling one of his from Houston or Brother Love. He had a few of those. Shitstain wouldn't really get it or understand it because he wouldn't understand the terminology. He didn't know any of the people involved. So he probably wouldn't have been entertained. But I never, in creative meetings where we were trying to work, just sat there and told stories for the specific nature of telling stories. What I did was I pitched shit, because that's what we were supposed to do. When you book, you throw ideas out. What if so-and-so did this? What if so-and-so wrestled this guy? What if this was the fucking finish? What if this was the angle to make these two guys mad? So you draw on personal experience, things you've done or things you've seen. So if in pitching stuff like that, that I was somehow going, oh, and then also you should bring these same guys back and book them now. Well, in some cases I may have, if they were still working. But no. But see, here's the problem there. Shitstain had never pitched angles or finishes because he'd never done any. And he didn't know what those words meant. It was like, it, I can see where he may have been frustrated because watching me Watching JR, even watching Bruce, it's kind of like watching a pilot fly a plane. Oh, you can tell that the end result of whatever he's doing is working, but you have no idea how the fuck he's doing it. Because he didn't know what the fuck any of this was. And he didn't know who the fuck or what the fuck any of us were talking about. He was watching Jerry Springer. He had seen as a fan wrestling angles, but he was watching Jerry Springer. But anyway, that's that's his reasoning is that Vince decided to Vince McMahon, not shit stain, but Vince McMahon decided to show me after I was already off the creative team because couldn't work together with shit stain. That all these guys that this wouldn't work and et cetera, just to prove a point. And so they, of course, you know, since this was my idea. I'm, I mean, I'm sure you're going to be able to see my fingerprints all over this uh, because after the initial grand debut of the NWA North American champion, I went back and looked at the record book and saw, and by the way, this is The History of Professional Wrestling by Graham Cawthon. It's the volume two WWF 1990 through 1999. Handy reference point. I bet uh, old Shitstain don't have one of these. He'd remember when he did his supposed shit. So. Anyway, any other questions before we move on to the next segment of the invasion? Because it gets better. Well, I was going to say, are we going to talk about the Rock and Roll Express and the other parts of the oh, invasion? Oh, yes. Yeah, oh, okay. yes. Because I took it at the time as, okay, this is an idea that they want to help give Jeff Jarrett something. Now he's got a belt and he's kind of an outsider. He's It's helping Jeff and it's given the NWA attention. So I'll be involved and I'll be more than happy to contribute cooperate right and by the way the nwa during this five month period of time i think this went on increased their member promoters from like seven or eight to some like 30 or 32 so it was a positive for them which is the only reason i stuck with it as long as i did and also as i mentioned you know jeff i thought they were legitimately going to try to do something with him this time around because you know especially being even shit stained like jeff right so 
But anyway, after that initial tremendous debut on television, let's see, the next Raw was in, I remember this, in State College, Pennsylvania. This was in, uh, this was January the 12th, because now they've done the NWA taping thing, and they call me back. It may, may not have even called me, may have talked to me that night, said, well, what, what other NWA guys? Well, the, at the time, the Rock and Roll Express were the NWA tag team champions again. It's the Rock and Roll Express. Well, can you get them? Well, of, of course. Yes, I can get them, but the, the point is, what are you trying to do with them? So they asked me, and so I make the connection with Ricky and Robert. And on January 12th in State College, they bring them in and put them on Raw. Now, by the way, the Rock and Roll Express are, at this point still to that time, the most popular babyface tag team attraction that Vince's only major competition over the previous 15 years has ever had. Because the rock and roll, when they were there, they were more over. The business was hotter than it had been to that point in time. Until 1997, they started heating up again. Now it becomes the Monday Night War thing. But do they do a history package? Do they do something to indicate in any reason, any way, why that you should like these guys who were last seen on national television seven years ago? Because they'd been in Smoky Mountain all that time and had the one match in WWF five years beforehand. No. They throw them out there. Listen to this match. Skull and eight ball. And all respect to the Harris boys. I like the Harris boys too, but they weren't exactly goddamn being used like fucking the Road Warriors at that time in the WWF. It was all that faction warfare bullshit, and it was on the low end of that. They were coming down, right? Skull and eight ball defeated NWA tag team champions, the Rock and Roll Express, via disqualification in a non-title match at two minutes and 29 seconds. <laughs> he didn't, I mean, maybe in hindsight now he was trying to, what he thought would get these guys over, but this looks like a complete sabotage job if being done by anyone that knows what they're doing. And the only reason you have to question it is because we know he didn't know what he was doing. Um, Hold on, were we at the Royal Rumble? We were in the Royal Rumble, I think. Jeff was fucking with Owen in the Royal Rumble. But then, um, okay, uh, uh, Raw in Fresno, California, January 19th. We all had to go to Fresno for this. NWA North American champion Jeff Jarrett and, oh, I'm sorry, with Jim Cornette and the Rock and Roll Express at ringside, pinned Bradshaw with Barry Windham. At 3.41, 3 minutes, 41 seconds, after Wyndham accidentally clotheslined his own partner, after the match, Wyndham turned on Bradshaw. Once again, in four minutes, Jeff's lost. Rock and Roll Express <laughs> wandered around ringside. We beat poor Bradshaw because, they, because Bradshaw and Barry Wyndham had been the failed new blackjacks. So this is all just a mess playing out on television. Um, on it, As a matter of fact, uh, the next day on a Raw taping, Jeff Jarrett, who I thought they were trying to push, the North American champion, beat Chains, who was Brian Lee, after the Rock and Roll Express interfered. So it took Jeff the, it, it, it help from the Rock and Roll Express to beat a guy they were using in the middle. So, And Jeff was the star of this group. Uh, let's see, where's the next Raw? Some of these are fun. Um, ah, hold on here. I got to get to, yeah, I think Evansville, Indiana. Yeah, e Evansville, Indiana. Jeff Jarrett and Barry Windham beat the Legion of Doom by disqualification in 557 when Bradshaw interfered <laughs> and chased after Windham. That's when they had brought the Legion of Doom back and wanted to bury them too. Uh, hold on here. Ah, here's a classic. Uh, Dallas, Texas, Reunion Arena. This is on uh, Raw is War. NWA Tag Team Champions Ricky Morton and Robert Gibson defeated the Headbangers via disqualification after one of the champions was thrown over the top rope to the floor, which was against NWA rules. <sighs> yes, we were going for using NWA rules, but every match that any of these guys had ended in a DQ or a run-in or a count-out. Uh, European champion Owen Hart beat NWA North American champion Jeff Jarrett by disqualification. The Headbangers then got involved in this. Poor Headbangers. 
The Headbangers the next week, actually the next day in Waco, Texas, Headbangers beat Ricky Morton and Robert Gibson for the NWA tag title uh, after Cornette hit Thrasher with his tennis racket, but Thrasher fell on top of Ricky Morton. During the bout, Thrasher threw Robert Gibson over the top to the floor, which would have caused a disqualification under NWA rules, but Hebner didn't stop the match. All this middle card bullshit. So this is going through February. Anyway, it's all DQs and two minute matches. I remember one, the print is too small to, for me to find it right off, but it was some kind of goddamn six man tag where now the rock and roll express have turned heel and, and they've joined up with me. And so is Barry Windham, but Taka Michinoku and the headbangers are on the other team. And we're going to have a six man tag match where the headbangers are going to do a promo, set Taka up to give a funny fucking comedy punchline. We're going to have a six-man tag, and there's going to be a finish, and then we're going to turn on somebody else, and there's going to be a switch and whatever the fuck. And they send us out there and say, the segment, you've got four and a half minutes, including entrances. So we went out as quickly as we could. And the headbangers set Taka up for the line, and Taka delivered the line, but because Taka's accent was so thick, absolutely nobody understood what he said. So nobody reacted. Then we had a one-minute-and-a-half-minute six-man tag, did a ridiculous finish, fucking did some kind of afterbirth, and everybody's going up the ramp, and it, it was live, too. They couldn't fix it, right? And we, I'm just, I'm fucking beside myself and everybody's got their head down and I come and I see shit stain berating the headbangers and Taka for the delivery of the line or whatever. And they walked off and I went over to him. It's when I was still, I knew by that point he was a complete idiot, but I didn't hate his guts. I was still trying to help him in some respect. And I set him down and I said, just so you know, I said that out there was the shits. We all know it was the shits. It was poorly conceived to begin with, and we didn't have enough time to do it, and it was too busy, but it was still the shits, and it was done a shitty way, and everybody knew it. And you were talking to some guys that are happy to be here and glad they've got the spot. But if you talk to certain people, Certain wrestlers like that, when they've come back from laying a complete shit in the ring on national television, and you start browbeating them like that, they're going to beat the fuck out of you. You wait till everybody goes and sits down in a locker room, <laughs> and then you say, well, that was a shits, wasn't it? Well, what happened? But you don't browbeat them when you're the one that gave them shit that couldn't possibly be done and it wasn't going to be very good to begin with, and then you're yelling at him about it afterwards, somebody is going to beat the fuck out of you. But he never listened to that advice. Anyway, so we went through the whole Rock and Roll Express here. Oh, and then he tried to start burying the headbangers, poor headbangers. Um, they got involved in this somehow. In uh, Wheeling, West Virginia, in March on Superstars, the Headbangers beat the Rock and Roll Express by DQ when Barry Wenham interfered and hit Mosh over the head with a chair. And due to the stipulations, the Headbanger that won the fall would earn five minutes in the uh, in the ring with Cornette, and that's when I the clip is around where I elbow drop and beat poor Chaz. Because, fuck, what am I going to do? You know, he's he's unconscious. Yes, that's an old angle too, but you don't fucking do this in the middle of shows with no fucking context and no push for any of the fucking participants. So anyway, that happened for a while, and then the Headbangers were the NWA champions, so at least they had something going for them. This was before that he put pretty much both... Well, I won't, I won't give Shitstain credit for in and both their careers, because Glenn Ruth was Thrasher. And he went, I think he was injured at one point, and while he was off, they sent him to do an appearance at a Major League Baseball game somewhere as a WWF talent, right? And he took his wife, and <clears throat> I don't remember this whole story because it's been almost 25 years ago, but if Glenn or Chaz is out there listening and wants to call in or write in or whatever, but Glenn took his wife to this ball game, she's sitting in the stands, and a foul ball beamed her in the fucking head. 
and gave her like, I, I don't know if it's permanent after 25 years, but at the time they were saying it was going to be permanent vision damage and all this shit. And so, and he was off anyway, I think, and, and then I think they sued, which I would, would have also, uh, and that got heat. And, and I think that was pretty much him and he was done, but Chaz then had to become beaver cleavage with his big titted mother that only lasted a few months because she wasn't even a wrestler. She's one of those twats that fucking shit stain would hire to play parts. And it was supposed to be an incest angle because shit stain is as absolutely as close as you can be to being a virgin and still having had the textbook definition of sexual intercourse and had to work his, all of his frustrations and his pubescent fantasies out on television and, Everybody had to be involved in some weird fucking thing. So that killed the headbangers. But this was beforehand when I was just beating them on television. <laughs> like any of this would be my idea. Um, 